In the past few years, more than 100 U.S. localities and the state of Hawaii have adopted laws raising the minimum age for the purchase of tobacco products to 21. Research suggests that as many as three in four Americans support the adoption of a Tobacco 21 law at the federal level. But legal barriers and opposition from industry groups could make that an uphill battle. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Michelle Mello, a professor of law and of health research and policy at Stanford University. Dr. Mello has co-authored a perspective article about the state of Tobacco 21 laws. Dr. Mello, how were minimum ages for purchasing tobacco originally established in the United States, and how successful have they been? Well, as a matter of federal law, they are set at either 18 or 19. The states have discretion in that area. The 2009 Family Tobacco Control Act established that if we would like to go beyond that in terms of a national law, that's going to have to come from an act of Congress. The FDA is not allowed to make that national rule through administrative regulations. You write in your article that the number of localities with Tobacco 21 laws has increased dramatically since 2013. What's driving that momentum now when we've known about the dangers of tobacco in young people for years? Well, I think that fortunately this is an example of where policy experimentation works exactly the way we hope it would work, which is that it starts at the local level, it's evaluated carefully, there are advocates who take the evidence, which has been favorable, and bring it to the policy community, and the idea begins to spread, and that enables the evidence base to grow, and it spreads further and begins to go to scale. Some of that advocacy has been done within the pediatrics community. For example, my co-author on the New England Journal of Medicine piece, Jonathan Winnikoff, a pediatrician in Boston, has been instrumental in spreading the idea within Massachusetts. But there's also been spread from legislator to legislator and through other tobacco advocacy groups. Has most of the action been legislative or has there been action through popular vote in some of the localities? I'm not aware of popular votes, but there are localities that are able to use rulemaking procedures in lieu of having a city council vote. Some have been able to do this through Board of Health regulations. You talk in your article about the California bill. If that does become law, what kind of effect do you think that'll have on other states? Well, I think when a vanguard state like New York or California, does something like this, it really gets attention and really puts the idea kind of up on the next shelf in terms of dissemination. So when we saw New York City take this approach, for example, there was a lot more interest in the idea, realization that this could be rolled out on a much bigger scale, and it piques the interest of others. So I would expect not only, you know, do we see the benefits of this approach now reaching millions and millions of additional children, but hopefully it reaches into additional states as well as they begin to follow the lead of a state that is very often among the pioneers of new approaches to public health. Last year, the Institute of Medicine predicted that increasing the minimum age for sale of tobacco products to 21 would produce a 12% reduction in smoking prevalence among adults. Is that because fewer Americans will ever try smoking if they have to wait till 21, or are there other reasons? That's the main idea. There may be some older teens who are dissuaded from continuing to smoke because all of a sudden it's a lot more of a pain to do that, to get the cigarettes. So they may reduce their consumption and eventually trail off using. But the IOM thinks that the primary effect comes from delaying the age of smoking initiation. Particularly among the 15 to 17-year-old age groups, we would expect to see a 30% reduction in smoking initiation. So over time, that translates into a large reduction in smoking prevalence in the general population. Speaking of that 15 to 17-year-old group, you say in the article that Tobacco 21 laws would have the greatest effect there because most people who currently buy cigarettes for minors are under 21. Are there other ways to prevent young adults or older adolescents from buying tobacco for younger people? Well, of course, and we have already a panoply of youth access restrictions in place from rules about where tobacco products can be physically located within convenience stores to existing age and other purchase restrictions. This is not a revolutionary idea. It shouldn't be something that provokes a lot of controversy because we already agree that children should not be able to purchase tobacco products. And this is just extending that rule in a way that helps prevent the acquisition of tobacco products by older teens who get it from their high school peers. By preventing that crucial 18 to 20 age group who are in school daily with younger teens from acquiring tobacco products, we can prevent a channel of distribution. 
So finally, a Tobacco 21 law on a national level would require an act of Congress, and in fact, the first federal Tobacco 21 legislation was introduced in September in Congress. What are the chances for that legislation's passing? It's hard for me to comment on that, to be honest. I'm just not aware of what the current status of the federal act is. But we hope that with this article, we can make the case that legislators don't have anything to fear, really, from supporting this act, that there is very much a strong evidence base supporting its passage enough to persuade the Institute of Medicine Committee that this was an idea worth taking to scale, that a majority of Americans support it, a supermajority in most age groups, 76% of Republicans support this idea, two-thirds of people aged 18 to 24, a majority of smokers. There is broad support, and the argument from industry against the law is very weak. Their argument is essentially one about lost sales, and that's never been an argument that we have permitted to carry the day when we're making rational choices about smoking regulations, that putting youth at risk for smoking initiation and a lifetime of problems is justifiable in order to maintain the tobacco revenue stream. So I'm optimistic that these arguments will carry the day as they have at so many lower levels of government. Thank you, Dr. Mello.